Before I start tonight, I'm going to have to apologize to you in advance. I have a what they call Sjogren's syndrome. It makes you where you have no tears and no saliva. So the only way that I can talk is to chew gum. I know it's impolite, but there's no other choice. I'm sorry. Also tonight, I would like to bring you greetings from the Smolensk Evangelical Christian Baptist Smolensk Evangelical Christian Church. Every time I go and preach, they ask me to bring you, bring my greeting, some greeting from them. Let's pray. Father, tonight as we turn our heart to your word, we ask that you would help us. We know that... uh, Unless we are enabled by your Holy Spirit, it's impossible to preach with in a way that's pleasing to you. And unless we, you enable us to hear and understand, we, it's difficult for us. So, Father, we ask by your mercy and by your grace that you would draw near to us tonight and help us. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Okay. I'm just a simple preacher. Started preaching in 1972. My wife and I lived in Russia for 20 years. Before that, we lived in St. Kitts for six years. Before that, I pastored a little Baptist church in Texas for 13 years. I believe the Bible is true. That it's the Word of God. That God expects, in fact, I would use the word demands. God expects us to know and to obey his word. I believe there's only two kingdoms. Kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. Makes no difference where you live in the world, what language you speak. There's only two kingdoms. Now... My church in Russia spoiled me. They're not used to short sermons. <laughs> and most people in America aren't used to long ones. And I know y'all have uh, choir practice at 8 o'clock, so right before that I'll just stop even if we're not finished. Okay, in... Late 1993, early 1994, Elise and I were living in Russia. I was doing what they call uh, theological education by extension. Elise and I traveled from city to city in the state where we were living. In the state of Smolensk, there was only five churches at that time. We would travel, leave the house about 6, 6.30, get home about 9, 10 o'clock, do that five days a week. And there was an uh, evangelist, a Canadian evangelist. I've never met him. They say he's pretty famous. He was preaching in Desnogorsk. It's a city in our, our state. And, they, and he reported that 1,500 people got saved. The meeting ended on a Friday. It was going to be one of my jobs to be there on Saturday morning after the meeting uh, ended and to teach a class called First Steps in the Christian Life. Now, they said 1,500 got saved, so they reserved an auditorium that held 300. They were hoping 20, um, they were hoping that 200 to 300 would show up out of the 1,500. In reality, 20 showed up. It's very, very common for, for that kind of uh, evangelic crusade. So you... 1,500 got saved, 20 showed up. I was prepared to teach about the first steps in the Christian life. But before we started, they said, we'd like to ask a question. I said, sure. They said, who is this God that we just believed in? Is it Buddha? Is it Allah? Is it Confucius? Is it Muhammad? Maybe it's an amorphous cloud, this cloud with no shape. And that cloud is sort of all the gods wrapped up into one. And, and that's the God that we believe in. 
That's not the question that you expect to be asked of those who supposedly have just got saved. I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you or not. I'd never had that happen to me before. I didn't know what to do, so I prayed. I said, Lord, help me. And God gave me three questions. First question, does God exist? Is the Bible true? Is Jesus Lord? And I've used those questions from, from then till today. So we started that morning, does God exist? They said yes, I said yes. We were in great harmony at that moment. We should have just sung Kumbaya and go home. <laughs> but me being the simple preacher that I am, I think we have a responsibility to help the souls who've been entrusted to us. So we opened our Bibles to Mark chapter 12. You know, the Bible is very divisive, very divisive. So we opened up Mark chapter 12, and I, just in two verses, I destroyed all the unity that we had there that morning. These are the words of Jesus Christ, Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 29. Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. In just a few simple words, and we destroyed the harmony that was there that morning. Everyone there that morning agreed some kind of God existed. Who was that God? And they really had a, the, their big problem, I think, was what is the Bible that the Bible can tell us who God is? So I hope you have your Bibles with you tonight. And when we open up that Bible, is it true? Well, in the sense of, is it authority? Does this book have the right to tell you how to believe and to act? It's a difficult question for a lot of people. Now, why is it so important that we understand that there's only one God? Well, let's look in the book of Isaiah, for example. Isaiah chapter 45. We're going to start at about verse 18. For thus said the Lord that created the heavens. God himself that formed the earth and made it. He hath established it. He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, seek ye me in vain. I the Lord speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. I don't know if you've ever considered it or not. Certainly those people on that long ago Saturday morning had never considered that it is possible to pray unto a God that cannot save. Right. Amen. You can pray fervently, sincerely, with tears, every day, without fail, and be praying to a God that cannot save. Amen. 
Imagine the catastrophe, disaster. You come to the end of your life. And the God that you've been praying to your whole life, sincerely, Amen. with sacrifice, with tears, and you find that that God cannot save you. Now let's read it in two more verses. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together, who hath declared this from ancient times, who hath told it from that time. Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. You see, we've tonight we've just read a few verses from the Bible. But already we've seen that that there is one true and living God. There's many gods who are fake or false. On one hand, there's a God who can save to the uttermost. And on the other hand, you see gods that cannot save. The Bible is very divisive. Now let's look in Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah is one of my favorite books in the Bible. I think it's a book that speaks to our day. So we're going to start in verse 3. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 3. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. Of course you understand he's speaking about idols. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O King of the nations? I'm sorry, O King of nations, for to thee doth it appertain. For as among all the wise men of the nations, and in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. So here the prophet describes for us, in just a few verses, he separates for us, just as Isaiah separated a God who can save from gods who cannot Now Isaiah, I'm sorry, Jeremiah is going to separate for us the the different gods. He talks about the idols. They're created by men. He said they stand up. Now he's not talking about stand up like you and I stand up, of course. He's talking about as a piece of wood would stand on on a shelf. They stand up, but they have no life. They must be carried. They cannot speak. They cannot move. He says, do not fear them. They cannot harm you. They cannot help you. So these idols, do not fear them. Then on the other hand, he speaks about our Creator. The God who made us and everything that's in existence. He is life. He is the source of all true life. He inhabits eternity. When he speaks, the earth trembles. The prophet said, you must fear him. He asks it in the form of a question first. Who would not fear thee? O king of the nations. 
If you were to ask today, who does not fear God? Now, I've spoken to, I don't want to mislead you, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pastors, preachers, teachers, church members. I've spoken on this topic in many churches. Only three in America have ever let me come back the second time. Who will not fear thee, O Lord? Vast majority of American evangelical Christianity, they don't fear God. They consider it as a heresy. It's an Old Testament idea. Who would not fear you? For to thee doth it appertain. Appertain is an interesting word. If you look in the old dictionaries, now don't look in the new ones because they're not very reliable, but I generally like to go back to the, at least the 1800s. Fear appertains to God. It belongs to Him. Now fear is one of God's names, so of course it belongs to Him. It is suited to Him. It is appropriate to Him. And it is owed to Him. So again, we've seen now this separation. A God you must fear from all the gods that you should not fear because they can't hurt you, nor can they help you. The God of the Bible can help you. He can also hurt you. So how many gods are there? Well, if the Bible is true, let's look in Deuteronomy 6. The Bible is true, there's only one God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, we'll read verse 4 and 5. It's almost word for word what Jesus said, but it never hurts to repeat. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thine might. This one God. Who is this God? Well, let's look in Psalm 100 in verse 3. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. The Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us. Now let's turn back just a couple of pages to Psalm 95. And let's start in verse 6. And we'll read down to verse 8. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord God, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness. God made us. We did not make Him. And lastly, Deuteronomy 4 Starting in verse 32. For ask now of the days that are past, which were before thee, since the day that God created man upon the earth, and ask from the one side of heaven unto the other, whether there hath been any such thing as this great thing is, or hath been heard like it. Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire, as thou hast heard and lived. Or hath God essayed to go and take him a nation from the midst of another nation by temptations, by signs, and by wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm, and by great terrors, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? Unto thee it was showed 
that thou, that thou mightest know that the Lord, he is God, and there is none else besides him. It says here in, in verse 34 that God, by great terrors, the word there that's, that's terrors is a word that speaks about terror itself means <clears throat> a very strong, intense kind of fear. So when you see terror in the Old Testament, it's speaking about the fear of God. In English, it's a little more difficult to understand, but, but it, it's true. All biblical truth is built on this one foundation, that there is only one God. He created us and everything. He reveals Himself to us. He made us. We did not make Him. If God does not do His work of grace in us, if we are not transformed by the power of the gospel, then we have no hope. We cannot make God into our image or according to our ideas. He is God, we are not. If the Bible is true, then the God of the Bible must be feared. Let's look in Psalms 96, 4. We're going to look at three different scriptures in the book of Psalms that speak about this. Ninety-six four, for the Lord is great, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Turn back just a little bit to Psalm eighty-nine. We're going to look in verse six and seven. This is a hard one. For who in the heavens, who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. I don't know about you, but I think tonight the saints have gathered together. Now, one of the ways that we know that the saints have gathered together is God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. Now, wise man might stop and think, well, what about all those places where God's not feared? I'm not talking about in the world. I've never had one lost person, even in Russia, where there's or I'm speaking to atheists, I have never had one lost person deny to me the fear of God. Only those who call themselves Christians. But we got a problem. Now it says he's to be held in rev had in, had in reverence. Reverence is another one of the words that speaks about the fear of God. Reverence. It's crazy, I understand. We're not supposed to fear God. We're just supposed to reverence Him. Reverence is not a light word. Reverence is the next to the strongest word that describes the fear of, the, the fear of God in the English language. Reverence is a very strong fear plus love. Now, if you look in the modern dictionaries, I'm even saying like 1965, Reverence, they say, is kind of like respect. Okay? Respect, according to the dictionary, is a word that is used to ex express a relationship between two who are equals or almost equal. I could have respect for Pastor Scott. But if you say you respect God, you're saying God is on the same level with you maybe just a little bit higher. Now that accurately describes how much of evangelical Christianity in America sees God. But that does not describe what the Bible says about God. You see the difference? And 76, Psalm 76, 7 through 12.
But of course, this is speaking about God. Thou, even thou, art to be feared. And who may stand in thy sight when once thou art angry? Thou dost cause judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still. When God arose to judgment to save all the meek of the earth, Selah. Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. The remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. Vow and pay unto the Lord your God. Let all that be round about him bring presents unto him that ought to be feared. He shall cut off the spirit of princes. He is terrible to the kings of the earth. Now terrible, he's not saying terrible like, I went to a new restaurant the other day. How was it? It was terrible. I'm never going back. That is not the biblical meaning of the word terrible. That is how it's used today. Terrible, all it means is God has the ability in and of himself to cause fear and dread in the hearts of men. That's all it means. Wow. There's no way we're going to get it finished. We're not even going to get started. But now, let's stop and think about it for a second. What if we really feared God? Vow and pay unto the Lord your God. Let all that be round about him bring presents unto him that ought to be feared. What if the Bible, let's just pretend tonight that the Bible is really true. And that God really expects us to do this. Does that change how we come to church on Sunday morning? It's totally different. Everything changes. Vow and pay unto the Lord. I don't know if you've ever really studied it out. That has to do with worship. That we owe to God a debt of worship and praise. And that when we come together on Sunday morning, we're not coming to please ourselves. We're coming to please God. And if, if that one thing could get into our hearts and lives, it would change everything when we come to church. I'm going to jump over because we're just out of time. But I, this verse fits in with this. Look in Revelation 14. Fourteen six, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people. Notice, comma, not a period, comma. He's preaching an everlasting gospel. And when he preaches the everlasting gospel, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth, and the sea, and the fountain of waters. What does the eternal gospel begin with? Fear God. What does the gospel we preach begin with? This is not a little thing. This is the eternal gospel. Remember, we're saying that what we read here is true and it has authority. Right? The eternal gospel begins with the fear of God. Sorry. 
2 Corinthians 5, 11, and then we'll close because y'all have to go to choir practice. Remember, the eternal gospel begins with the fear of God. Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are, being made, we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also made manifest in your consciences. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Realize this used to be a requirement for all who would ever stand and preach, teach, evangelize, do any kind of trying to persuade men. It used to be a requirement that, that you know the terror of the Lord. Not just the fear of God, the terror. Now, I've been studying this more than 20 years now. I'm going to tell you what I think the terror of the Lord is. Number one, you know the Bible verses that speak about the fear of God. Now, I gave Brother Troy and what I call the short homework. What I've tried to do is find some of the, some of, not all, some of the verses that speak about the fear of the Lord. There's 15 pages of them. Why do I call it the short? Because I've, if I were to bring you tonight the full, every verse in the Bible... It's about this tall. It's well over 140 pages. I'm just asking you to look for 15. You know what the Bible says about the fear of the Lord, number one. Number two, you know by experience because the Holy Spirit of God has gripped your heart and shaken you to the very core of your being. You know the terror of the Lord by experience. What the Bible says, and by experience. Then, according to the Bible, you're ready to preach, teach, and persuade men. Now, I went to five years of Bible college. Never heard about the fear of the Lord. In fact, it was 1993, 1994 before I ever heard my first sermon on the fear of the Lord. It used to be inculcated, taught often and by repetition from our pulpits here in America. Yeah, that's right. Not anymore. All right, what is the fear of the Lord? I'll give you one example and then I'll close. I also brought five books. They're free. If you want them, you can have them. What is the fear of the Lord? Now, the, we know that God is eternal. That God lived in eternity past before he created the heavens and the earth, right? Now, just imagine that you were with God wherever God was before he created the heavens and the earth. And one day the Lord comes to you and he says, come with me. He's the Lord. What do you do? You go. And he takes you all the way out to the very edge of the place where God was living. And the Lord says, what do you see out there? You're a little confused. There's nothing out there. And the Lord says, watch this. And with nothing but his mouth, he says, let there be light. Amen. Instantly, there's light. Where there was nothing, now there's something. And he speaks again and he drives, he divides the light into darkness. He separates them. And he speaks again and there's stars and planets and solar systems and everything that we call the cosmos. And all of this happened just by him speaking it into existence out of nothing. If you could have seen that, what would you fear? What would you feel? What you would feel is what the Bible calls the fear of the Lord. Now it grows from there. 
because that's just based upon what God did. There's also a whole area of the fear of the Lord that speaks about our reaction when we see who God is. Who He is is much more important than what He did. So, 7.59.50, I finished before, I mean, I I stopped before 8 o'clock. Let us pray. Father, we confess before you tonight that we have fallen fall short. That we do not give you the fear that is due you, the fear that is owed. We have tried to persuade men, not knowing the terror of you. And we've gotten sort of confused about the eternal gospel. I ask that you would help us. Help us, Lord. Thank you for your kindness and mercy to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All God's people said. Father, we are so grateful for what we've heard tonight. I don't believe that We have even scratched the surface here. Teach us to fear you. Teach us what it means that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Teach us what it means to know the terror of the Lord. Lord, I want to fear you more. I understand that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I can't even have wisdom unless I fear you. You said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. I can't even have knowledge unless I fear you. Lord God, I pray that you'd work in my heart and our hearts as we learn to fear you more. And and then, Lord, as we approach our services, as we approach fellowship, as we approach life, Remind us of what we've heard tonight.